Hey guys, good morning. My name's Lucas Stuckey. I'm one of the elders here at Integrity Church. I just wanted to welcome you guys this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us online. Uh, we're starting a new sermon series in 2 Peter today about a, a scattered church. And so it's definitely a concept that's not foreign to us anymore. Uh, we're actually living it right now. Uh, but before we get started in that, uh, before we get started in worship and Ben's message, I would like to uh, just open us with a word of prayer. Father God, we are thankful uh, for what you've done through your son, uh, what that means uh, for us, uh, what we got to celebrate last week, that your son uh, lived a perfect life, that your son uh, died a death that we were supposed to, and that your son uh, rose again and is now interceding uh, for us. God, we are just thankful in that. We're thankful that that was a promise that you had from the very beginning, that we saw that in the very uh, first words of scripture, that you had a promise and a plan uh, to ultimately redeem us as a church. And God, as you just continue to strengthen us in that promise, continue to strengthen us in, in that hope that we can hold to uh, while we look around and see that we are struggling in hard times, God. Uh, we don't understand what's going on around us, that we can understand that you are uh, greater than this world. And so is that hope, that hope that we have in your son and what he did for us and the hope that we have in you, the fact that you can take evil things, what people mean and intend for evil, and you can make them into good. Uh, God, we're thankful for that. And as we are scattered now and we're struggling with that, struggling to stay in community, I ask God that you just uh, allow your spirit to strengthen us, to be kind, to be patient, uh, to reach out and encourage one another, God, that we understand a deeper level of community uh, as believers in this and what we are currently uh, doing in our lives, God, and, and what is currently going on in the world. Uh, God, we're just ultimately thankful for what you have given us and the hope that relies in you and your goodness for us. In your name we pray. Amen.
with your truth. We ask for this. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, Integrity 
Church, Pastor Ben here. I'm so thankful that we get to start a new series this morning in the book of 2 Peter. And it's a series that we've entitled Church Scattered. And we're looking forward to beginning this this morning. Three things I want to challenge you in as we jump into this series. Uh, Number one, we want you to be reading the Word. Uh, We've got six weeks into this series. We want to encourage you to to be in the Bible. Uh, I want to encourage you to read 1st and 2nd Peter uh, every week for the next six weeks. Let's just take some time. Maybe there's just chapters that you want to be slower in and and read and focus and study. Maybe grab some commentaries or study Bibles and maybe just help you develop sort of a better understanding of what God is after in 1st and 2nd Peter. The second thing I want to encourage you in Every week we provide some reflection questions at the end of the service. Read those. Be in the Word together with your families. Uh, We have a study guide that's available online. If you go to our website, liveintegrity.org, and follow our 2 Peter page, you'll see a study guide there for you. It can help you understand the context, background, why we chose the book, and it will also have some reflection questions there. So spend some time doing that uh, every week. Make sure you spend time at the end of the service every week to— to take maybe notes or talk about, discuss with your family, your friends. Um, Spend some time doing that. The last thing I want to encourage you to do is to find someone that can really be in the well with you in this season. And what I mean by that is have somebody that is in your life that you can talk to on the phone. Maybe it's, I know we can't do small groups as as much with, uh, at least in person, we can do it through Zoom calls. And I hope you are doing that. And I hope that's going well for you. But maybe you just need to find somebody that you can call every week to just, hey, how's your, how's it going with reading first and second Peter? And what are you learning? Uh, Where are you being challenging? Where where are you being challenged? Where do you need to grow? Uh, Maybe you can spend some time uh, doing that in these next uh, six weeks. So I want to encourage you in those three things as we uh, move forward in the book of Second Peter. I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump right in to what God has for us this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we could be in your word. And we, we're thankful for technology, that we continue to, to serve and, and, and to be in community together through, uh, even if it's just church scattered. I pray, Father, that you would just help us now to, to learn and to, to grow and to be, uh, of, be in your word and to be available for one another. I pray, God, that you would help us to know what it means to be the church scattered. What a, what a fitting time uh, to go through this uh, book together as we are scattered. Uh, Lord, I, I know that our sufferings don't compare to the sufferings that we even see that's happening in, in the word that we see in the, in the story that we're about to unpack. But Lord, even, even with our suffering, Lord, we bring that to you. We bring our anxieties to you because we know that you, you do care for us, that you do love us, and you, want us, and you want to use this season to make us more like you. And I pray that, Lord, in, in your precious holy name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 13 this morning. When I was about seven years old, I experienced what I thought was a miracle. Now, I love popcorn, and so my mom would always bring home popcorn, and in these days, I was about five or six years old, we used to have uh, stovetop popcorn. I'm, I'm kind of aging myself. Uh, we didn't like grow up with a microwave until I think it was like five or six or somewhere in that same range, and so stovetop popcorn was the way to go, and shortly after that, we'd gotten a microwave, and my mom said, I'm, 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 I'm bringing home popcorn from the grocery store, and so we were all excited. I was excited, and so she pulls out popcorn, but it's not in a stovetop. If it was a stovetop, it was like this little styrofoam, like um, a tinfoil uh, round thing that she put on the stove, and it pops and blows up, but then she brought home this little box, and in the box, and you know, it's microwave popcorn. It's four or five different little bags wrapped up, and then you open, you open the package, and then it's just this flat bag, and I was like, how is that going to become popcorn? Well, then she puts it and lays it in the microwave, and she closed the door. And those, in those days, it was a big, giant microwave with a big light, and it would s- s- rotate and spin around just like our microwaves today, but it was giant. So we all, as a family, were interested, how is this going to become popcorn, this flat bag? So she lays the bag into the microwave. The microwave begins to rotate, you know, three minutes or whatever it was, And then I'll never forget our family all gather around the microwave (laughs) to watch this miracle take place. And I remember the first pop, we all just jumped. Oh my gosh, 
this is happening right before our eyes. And then all of a sudden, pop, 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 and then the bag becomes full. And then we witnessed, to me, at this season was a miracle. Now, how did this happen? Well, popcorn, each kernel has moisture inside each kernel. And as it's heated up, it expands and eventually what's inside will burst the outer shell. Now, in some way, this is sort of what it's like to, to become a Christian. When, when we become a believer, the, this miracle takes place in our lives. When our inner soul and, and our hearts are, when we trust Christ and we apply the truth of the gospel to our lives, we change from the inside out. And what is in our And our soul begins to stir and we become believers. We have a new heart and we sort of burst through the outer shell. We burst through the flesh. That's what happens when we become believers. And so how do we know if that's really happened? How do we know if that change has taken place in our lives? Well, this is what we're going to see in 2 Peter this morning. This is really the heart of what Peter is after as he writes this letter to this church. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this church. This church is a scattered church. You see it in chapter one, that Peter's, or, 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 uh, first Peter, that Peter's talking to a church that's scattered due to persecution. Rome was greatly threatened by the rise of Christianity. And so they forced the Christians to move out of the major cities and into obscurity and to be separated, some of them from their families. I want you to feel even the the tension uh, for these early believers. These early believers, they lost their homes. They've been separated from their communities, their families. They've lost their loved ones. Some were facing starvation, some sickness. And so Peter writes and he he lets them know, hey, even though you've, you've been persecuted, even though you've been forced to live in obscurity, even though you've been forced to scatter As Rome is trying to get you to really quarantine the gospel, the gospel cannot and will not be contained. That's what Peter is trying to show them, that if Christ is truly at work in your life, what is inside, the change that's made in the inside, is going to burst through. The gospel will not be contained. But as they're going through all of these hardships, it was so easy for them to lose hope. Now, Peter, of all people, knew what it was like to lose hope. We can remember stories about Peter, even just studying for the last year and some change, the Gospel of Mark together. We see that Peter is a a key character. In all four Gospels, you see that. Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels more than anyone else besides Jesus. No one else speaks in the Gospels as much as Peter Sp- uh, and, and Jesus spoke to Peter more than anyone else. Yet, it's Peter who often loses heart. Earlier in the Gospels, you see Jesus, he's on a boat, and he walks, he tells Peter to, to walk on the water, and Peter begins to be afraid. He sees the winds, and he sees the current, and he begins to be afraid, and he cries out to God, and he begins to lose heart, and he begins to sink until Jesus pulls him up. Uh, Peter is the one who right before Jesus' trial, he says, "Uh, I would die before I would forsake you. And then Jesus tells Peter, three times you're going to forsake me. And of course, three times Peter forsakes him, one of which he tells a peasant girl who asks, hey, aren't you the one who's associated with Jesus? And he says, I don't know the man. And, And so Peter is this one who often would lose heart in the Gospels. However, John's Gospel tells us that it was Peter who, with John, ran to the tomb on the morning of the resurrection after hearing the report of the three women who were there and witnessed the empty tomb. You see, Peter knew what it was like to lose heart, to lose hope, but what changed Peter's life was that he witnessed an empty tomb. He saw a risen Savior. And not only that, but Peter also saw the power of the gospel at work in the early church. 
Peter witnessed the, the wonderful event that we see take place in, in, the, in the early part of Acts with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls upon the church and thousands of people get saved. Peter's the first one to, to preach the sermon and, and then he sees the life transformation happen in the church. He sees community happen. He sees people then responding to the gospel by taking care of needs around them, by uh, taking care of needs of one another, by showing hospitality, by sh- sh- sharing possessions for one another. He saw the gospel uh, take down racial walls. He, he saw the gospel move beyond Jerusalem to Samaria, uh, to the Greeks, to uttermost parts of the world. And so Peter was a man who at one time in his life lost tremendous hope. And then once he saw the risen Christ, once he saw the power of the Holy Spirit, he was a changed man. Everything about his life changed. What Peter knew, he knew what it was like to lose heart. But here he is as a man who's convinced that once you encounter the living God and that you are a a part of the body of Christ, you can endure through all circumstances. You can have hope. So Integrity Church, as we read this letter, we read it from a man who's convinced that the church of Jesus Christ can still grow even when we are the church scattered. So let's see what Peter has to say as he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to these scattered believers. He says in 2 Peter verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord. Now, Peter here is the author. He's writing this letter around 66 AD, just a few years after he wrote 1 Peter. He opens this letter with the desire to see grace and peace multiplied in the knowledge of God. Of Christ. Now, we'll explain what that means when he says, in the knowledge of Christ, and we see it in the next few verses. Verse 3, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, though the, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now, Peter's really focused on this idea of the knowledge of God. You you see it in in, in verse 3. He says the knowledge of God or the knowledge of Christ. This is a big emphasis in Second Peter about the knowledge of God. He, he mentions know or knowledge at least 13 times in this letter alone. Now as you read this letter, you, 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 you have to understand something about when, he, when he's talking about knowledge. He's not just talking about an, in, an intellectual understanding of truth, although that is included. He's really talking about what it means to know and to walk in the truth of God's word. For instance, you see in the Gospel of John, when, when Jesus is praying the high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 3, he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you. This is what he's praying on our behalf to the Father. He's saying uh, that eternal life is that, that we would know God. He says, The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus, even in the prayer, he says, My hope is that my people would know God. Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Now, the knowing that Peter speaks about and that Paul speaks about in Philippians 3 is this word epignosis. It's the Greek word epignosis, which is, is not just a knowledge of or about something. Rather, it's a knowledge that comes from experience or personal relationship. So, so let me explain why that's different than just intellectual knowledge. When I was dating my wife, Jess, 
I, I was in seminary at the time, and I'd just taken, you know, I think we're right, we weren't quite engaged yet, but I was, I'd just taken a marriage and family class. And I was thinking, well, I'm the one who's, who knows about marriage because I've just taken a marriage and family class, right? I, I studied uh, at that time to Song of Solomon, which is about, you know, pursuit and how to pursue in marriage. And so I was thinking, in, in my mind, I was thinking, man, I have such an edge here over, over Jess. I know so much about marriage. That she hasn't taken these classes. She hasn't ex, ex, uh, like done an exegetical work on Song of Solomon. I've done all those things, you know, so, sort of in my mind, I'm like, I got this, right? Uh, just, just, just follow my lead. I'm the one who's taken the classes. But what happened? Well, I got married. What do you think I learned? Well, I learned my first year, my first three years, now I've learned that I really don't know much about marriage. Why? Because it's really an experience. And as you become more married over time, you go through the process of year one, year two, year three, you begin to learn more because it's really this experience. Meaning you can read all the books about marriage, but until you're married, you don't have an epignosis about marriage. You don't have an experiential knowledge about marriage. You can read books on child and adolescent development and about best practices of raising children, but it's hard to understand fully what it means to be a parent until you are a parent. Information, informational knowledge about something isn't enough. It's important. It's essential, but it's not enough. You need knowledge with experience. This is what Peter is after. Now, here's the good thing about suffering. I, I know we often hate suffering and we, we want to avoid it at all costs, but here's the good thing about it. We can take, we get to take what we know about God and experience God in a real and tangible way. And nothing causes us to experience God more than when we're in suffering. When we have to take, and we're forced to take what we know about God and apply it. And we're forced to take our anxieties, our fears, our anger, and, and apply it to what we know about who God is and his sovereignty. Once we are in suffering, it forces us to have this epignosis. We know something in our minds, we know something in our hearts, but we get to experience it through suffering. Verse 3, again, he says, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So again, Peter is saying, with this knowledge, with this epignosis, he says he's granted us all things that pertain to to life and godliness. Some of your translation says he's given, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now, now think about that. We have everything we need for life and godliness. What more could we want or need, if this is true? This means that knowing Christ will give us everything that we need. We will have everything that we need once we know who Christ is. This is why Peter calls us partakers in his divine power, his divine nature. That through Christ we will lose a taste for the things that we used to love in this world, that we used to find joy in, and we'll then have a new desire of the things of God that we'll never need again. In fact, this is what Jesus says to the woman at the well who's, who's caught in an affair. And Jesus is speaking to this woman, and he says to this woman as she's taking a drink from the well, he says, Whoever drinks the water that I give you will never thirst again. And so he's saying, if you have this knowledge, this experience with Christ, you'll never thirst again. You ever had a season where you feel like, man, I, I don't need anything other than the Lord? Maybe you've had seasons like that in your life. Maybe the season is right now, and praise God for that for you. But maybe you've had seasons where, man, it just felt like your relationship with Christ was just more fresh. Maybe you've just had incredible seasons of discipline, being in the Word, being in prayer, saying no to sin, inviting people into your life, inviting people in to see the real you, living in community. Maybe you just had an incredible season of just sharing the gospel, like wherever you went, it just was just natural for you. You could just do it. Maybe it's just a season of just great generosity, 
that you just gave more than you normally did, you just served more than you normally did, but then it just sort of slowed down. Maybe for some of you, it even just stopped. What happened there? How, do we, how is it that we keep going? Well, Peter gives us some hope in that. Verse 5, he says, For this reason, very reason, he says, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. So what does Peter mean when he says virtue? What does this word capture in Peter's mind when, when he's trying to communicate this to the church? The word virtue, we actually see the same Greek word in verse 5 that we actually see in verse 3. In verse 3, he says, he's called us to a knowledge of him, to his own glory and excellence. Interestingly enough, the word for excellence in, in the Greek and the word for virtue are the same word. It's a, it's a word called erate. Now, I've used two Greek words in the sermon, so you're welcome, right? Uh, which means, erate means excellent. Mean, many, many times we think of excellent, we think of close to perfect, right? Think, man, that was excellent. We're thinking almost perfect. But that's not what Peter is actually saying he, when he uses this word. That, the Greek understanding of this word, for instance, the Greek philosophers at this time would, m- took this word excellent to mean the fulfillment of a thing. Meaning when anything in nature fulfills its purpose, that is, they would say, it has virtue or moral excellence. For instance, if land produced its crop properly, it would, people would say, well, that was excellent it, because it's, feel, it's filling its purpose. If a tool was used properly, it was used excellently. It was, it, the tool was fulfilling what it was created to do. It's fulfilling its purpose. So for the believer in Christ— We are to glorify God because, as Peter says, God's divine nature is in us for believers in Christ. And he says, and and when this is evident in our lives, when it begins to show up, when the the kernel gets hot in our hearts and it begins to burst through the outer shell, our flesh, and it becomes evident, we are fulfilling our purpose. We're showing the excellencies of Christ in us in our lives. And so Peter says it it starts with this idea of virtue, that you begin to fulfill your purpose, to glorify God with your life, through your obedience to him, your honor to him, through your sacrifice to him. He says it shows up through virtue, and then he continues, verse 5. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Then he says, with virtue, with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to what Jesus just said, I mean, what Peter just said. Maybe you're reading along with me in verses 5 through 7, and, and you're already beginning to judge yourself. You're reading words like knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, love, and you're like, oh, knowledge, like there's just so many people that know more about the Bible than I do or have a better understanding than me or they just have so much more experience in life than I do. What, what do I even have to offer? What do I even have to show for that? Maybe you're looking at self-control and you're like, man, I, I wish I could watch what I say better. I just don't have self-control. Or um, I, I could say no. I wish I had self-control to say no to food more. Or uh, maybe it's pornography more. Or I, I wish I could just get a better grip on my, my temper. I've got a bad temper and I just have no self-control. Maybe you're judging yourself with godliness. Man, I wish I was more humble. I wish I was more meek. I wish I was more generous. I wish I was more obedient. Maybe for you, it's brotherly affection. Man, I wish I was a better friend. Uh, I wish I was a better spouse. I wish I was a better parent. I wish I was a more caring person. I wish I was a better listener. Or maybe it's just love. I wish I could love unconditionally. I wish I wasn't so judgmental. I wish I wasn't so jealous. I wish I, was, I, wish I would give, give to others without expecting anything in return. 
And of course we all want to grow in these areas, right? But what does Peter really say? Is he just saying, hey, go do these things. Just go figure out how to master these things. Go, go figure out how to perfect these things. No, he's actually showing us a process. A process by which the Spirit begins to do in our hearts. He says, he, remember back in verse 3, he says, he has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Meaning, these qualities that show up in verse uh, 5 through 7, knowledge, self-control, godliness, brotherly affection, love, they're actually yours now. Because this is what the Spirit has done in your life if you're a believer in Christ. If you believe that Christ died on the cross, you believe that Christ has rose from the grave, you've surrendered your life to him, he's given you a new heart. And this new heart desires Christ more each and every day. Now, it doesn't feel that way at times. You have seasons of doubt. You have seasons of, that are like these right now that we're in. And we, we begin to kind of lose heart. And we begin to say, man, I'm, I'm just sort of out of step of, of what these mean. But if these qualities are yours in Christ, they belong to you. It's sort of like DNA. They begin to grow over time in your heart and your soul. Now, let me show you verse 8 because I think there's some encouragement there. Again, he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he's saying, if these qualities are yours, they are going to show up. If they're not yours, there's going to be a concern. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if they are yours, it means that you're a believer in Christ. It's similar to the fruit of the Spirit. We see in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He's not saying you're going to have one or a few of these things. He's not saying you're going to to do some of these really well. You're not going to do any of these at all. He's saying no. All of these things are evidence of the Spirit's work in your life. Paul is saying you'll begin to start showing these things because you are a changed person. This, again, is what's becoming, beginning to burst out of you because of a heart change. Peter is saying the same thing here in 2 Peter 1. These qualities are go- going to begin to show up and grow in you because this is God showing his excellence in you. You see, there's nothing to add to this. It's God's work who's already in you if you are a believer in Christ. It's God showing himself in you. Paul says to Timothy, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, the only way we can work it out is because it's already there. It's not to manufacture holiness. You can't make yourself look like Christ with the works of the flesh. It's, it's kind of like exercising or, or working out with your, with your muscles, right? When you, when you work out, you can't transform fat into muscle. No, you have to lose fat so you can build muscle. But you'll never build uh, fat, fr- you will never build muscle from fat. Fat doesn't turn into muscle. And this is what a lot of people try to do with when they read things like these, when they read things like, okay, I've just got to get better at knowledge. I've got to use willpower to get better at brotherly affection or get better at love. And we try to sort of manufacture this thing. And, and we cannot manufacture holiness. It has to come from within. It's just like turning, trying to turn fat into muscle. They're two completely different things. And a lot of people try to turn the flesh into the spirit and they end up with sin management, not life transformation. It's sort of like wearing Spanx. You've heard of Spanx? They're the little strap that goes around your stomach to covers, you know, what's underneath. And we, it looks better on the outside, but it's not really what's the condition of your physical body. God does not want us to wear sp- spiritual Spanx. He wants us to show the life of Christ from the inside out. It's like, again, the exploding popcorn kernel. The the Spirit overcomes the flesh. And so if these qualities are not showing up, 
You can continue to try to manufacture it on your own, in your own flesh, and your own ability, but it won't really work. It would only destroy us. And so if these qualities aren't showing up from the works of the Spirit, this should raise a question of what's really happening in our hearts. He says this in verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So how, does, how do you not forget? How do you, how do you keep reminding yourself? How do, you, how do you stay in line? And how do you continue to walk in the knowledge of the gospel? This epic gnosis, how do you do it? Well, he says in verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent, and I love this, to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Now, I love these verses because Peter is urging the believers to remember remembrance is such an important thing in the Bible. You see it in seasons that in, in Israel's history, God would want his people to remember uh, things that he's done for them in the past. You think about the Passover, the Passover again, annual celebration to remember God's deliverance of his people. He wanted them to always go back and remember. And what does Peter tell the believers to do? I want to remind you of two things. He says, I want you to confirm your calling and your election. Both of these things, by the way, they go hand in hand. They're, they're kind of theological, and, and they're also really practical words. Election is that God knew you and shows you before you were even a human thought. Before you came into the world, you were elected. He, he knew you, that he loved you first. Election is a beautiful thing. Before you were even thought of on this earth. God knew you and chose you in spite of you. It's beautiful. But not only election, but he says you were elected, uh, you're, not only you're elected, but you're also called. Uh, Romans 8.30 says those he, he predestined, he also called. And what Peter and Paul mean when they talk about calling, it's not like calling like I'm called to go overseas or I'm called to be a pastor or I'm called to marry this person. He, he's actually talking about a calling to salvation. In other words, Peter is saying, go back and remember the time where Jesus called you to himself. When was that for you? For me, it was when I was 12 years old. Uh, my parents just got divorced. I was uh, in a pretty dark place in my life. I was 12 years old. I went to a Christian school of all things and there I heard the gospel, and I, I, I experienced a true life change where I, I saw sin be put to death for me. Not that I didn't stop sinning, but I saw a life change. And one of the beauty, beautiful things of this is every time I think about that, I remember that God is with me, that I have seen these qualities show up in my life. As I think about me being 12 years old, I'm, that's, I'm, that's three time, I'm three times now older than like how I was when I first became a believer. It's scary, right? And so I think back all the times that I've been a believer. Most of my life, I've been a believer now. And I can think back to the times that God has given me knowledge and that God has given me uh, joy and that God has given me brotherly affection for others, that God has given me self-control that he's shown all of these qualities in my life, helping me going back to confirm my calling and then fast forwarding to where I am now. I know that I am a new creation. And this is the power of remembering. Maybe you've been on social media this last week and so many people had testimony videos where they're saying, hey, this is how Jesus changed my life. So sort of, a, sort of getting us ready to 
for Easter. How did Jesus change your life? The beauty of that, it's just all of these people remembering the story of when God called them. So confirm your calling. When was the time that, that Jesus really called you to himself? Maybe you were younger, maybe it was recent. And how do you know if Jesus called you what always comes with life change? It always shows up with life change. So what Peter's sim- doing simply is this. Hey, if you're, if you're struggling, you're just like, man, I'm just not growing the way that I, I want to grow right now. I'm just not satisfied with my time in the Word or my discipline or maybe sharing the gospel or my attitude or my heart. I'm just not satisfied with it. And, and I hope that there is some discontentment here. I hope that you're not like, man, I'm just doing great. My prayer life's great and everything. You know, I, hopefully there's something there that just some discontentment. So what do we do with that? Well, simply put, Peter in the latter verses verses 10 through 13, he just wants to remind them of one thing, and that's the gospel. Remember your calling. Remember your, when, in your election. That God shows you that he called you to himself and that he saved you. He brought you from death to life. Milton Vinson wrote a short little book called The Gospel Primer. And in this, he has this wonderful quote. He says, there is simply no other way to compete with the four bondings of my conscience, the condemnings of my heart, and the lies of the world and the devil, than to overwhelm such things with the daily rehearsings of the gospel. I love this quote because it's like, man, if there's anything that can encourage you in seasons of doubt and despair, it's rehearsing the gospel. And so, friends, if we really want to be a scattered church, and if we really want the gospel to explode in this community and in this world in this season, we need this now more than ever, to remind ourselves of the gospel and to know that the Spirit is truly at work in our lives and that we would see Christ show up where we began to show knowledge, self-control, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. That's what God wants to see in this church. That's what God wants to see in our lives. So we trust his work, remind ourselves of the gospel, and believe if we're in Christ that the Spirit is truly at work in us. God help us. Let's pray. Father, you're so kind to us. You're good to us. Lord, we love you. I pray, Father, that you would help our church now to rehearse the gospel. And would you help us also to know that the Spirit is working in our lives. God, I pray for those who are tuned in and maybe listening and don't have this relationship with you. I pray that you, through your Spirit, would call them to yourself. That you would draw them to yourself and that you would show them their need for you. Give them faith to repent of their sins and to trust you. But God, for those of us who know you, will we confirm our calling and election? And will we trust you? In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I invite you to respond to the gospel. And we invite you to respond through giving sacrificially and generously. If this is, you're just tuning in, we just want to say thank you for tuning in. We don't want your money. We're just glad that you're listening. But if you call Integrity Church your home, we're going to invite you to give. And you can give through online or through our app, or you can mail us a check, and we just appreciate so much of your generosity. Through your generosity, we can continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the city and to the masses as other people are listening online. And then as we continue to grow as a ministry, we want to plant churches. We want to be all about, all about the kingdom of God and seeing the work of the gospel change people's lives. The second thing I invite you to do is to take communion wherever you are. Maybe you're at home, and if you have those elements of the bread and the wine or the juice, you can take the bread, and the bread is just a reminder of Jesus' body that was broken for you on the cross. You'll take the bread, and you'll dip it into the cup. The cup is a reminder that Jesus' blood was shed for us. And this is, again, how life change happens. We remind ourselves of the gospel. What a wonderful time that we have to rehearse the gospel today to confirm our calling and election. So if you're a believer in Christ, I want to encourage you to take those elements. And if you're not a believer, I I would would encourage you to, to not take these elements, but to repent and to trust Christ. This is a family meal together that we have 
to remember our calling and election. So would we take the Lord's Supper together? The last thing I invite you to do is take some time right now to, to look at these reflection questions, to pray, for, pray over them with, maybe with your family, discuss them with your spouse, discuss them with your roommate, wherever you are, that you would just take some time and reflect on all that God is showing you in Second Peter. Thanks again for listening. We love you. 